I'm a hair mineral analysis expert. I have a background in functional medicine and I educate people using HTMA testing to maximize health, erase debilitating symptoms and gain energy. I'm a multi-time kettlebell sport world champion and I'm constantly searching for high performance pros from all over the world to bring you this human optimization podcast. My name is Lisa Patel Killa. Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Human Optimization Podcast. Here with me today, I have Dr. Karen Von Mervik Wavera. And for those of you who don't know me, of course, I am your host, Lisa Patel Killa. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Karen. She's a medical doctor lecturing at integrative medical conferences on diverse topics related to biomedical inter- interventions. She is a member of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, as well as the International College of Integrated Medicine. Dr. Von Melvick Guevara realized in 2010 while working hands on healing modalities with patients suffering from neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's ALS, that the issues they were dealing with were affecting every cell in their body, not just their nervous system. So this led to her research and study of minerals, which we'll talk about today, and metals, biochemistry and physiology, as she tried to unlock the secrets of how to rebalance minerals to regain health. Since then, she's been correlating cases and diagnostic testing while changing lives. Please welcome Dr. Karen Von Merville Guevara. Thank you, Lisa. Yes. And so tell our viewers and our listeners just a little bit about your story. Obviously, you're from Germany. That's where your initial study was. And so share with us a little bit about you. So, right. I think that uh, kind of sets me off on a different path than most uh, medical doctors in the United States, mm-hmm. uh, viewing that in Germany, it's mandatory, even during medical studies, to uh, get exposed to different mod- modalities compared to the United States. It's more integrative, I think. Um, mm-hmm. I think even it starts with a more practical, hands-on experience. So when we head into medical studies over there, uh, there is a practicum that we have to do first, uh, minimum two months where we basically have to do the menial jobs of the lowest uh, you know like member of the hierarchy at the medical hospitals um, meaning you're pushing bedpans you're like making beds you know or learn about the importance of a total flat bed you know yeah. like no crease no nothing and it starts like in a more hands-on fashion I think in a more maybe patient focused way already Mm -hmm. and then uh we have to do mandatory um like lessons in naturopathic medicine in things called balneotherapy meaning uh baths and cures and um have to learn about homeopathy we have to um yeah already learn about naturopathy because it's not different tracks In Germany, it's all one. So if you finish your medical studies, you have basically been exposed to all these different modalities and then you choose. So even a naturopathic medical doctor in Germany um, has gone through the uh, normal track of becoming an MD or toward working an Ah, MD. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that gives you a much broader picture because people resonate. And obviously this, uh, you know, is in your case, resonate with different modalities different methods of healing true and yeah yeah, i i like in that way i think um we are being provided with a broader setup yeah what we lack maybe compared to other countries in europe is a more practical exposure early on Mm. yet i did some time in uh france as well doing my medical studies Yes, and that's right. So get, tell us a had, little bit about that, what, like what well, the differences were. The differences there are that uh, starting in your third year of mm-hmm. your clinical studies, you're basically an extern, you're working in the hospitals alongside uh, everybody else. So you do get even there more practical experience. I really enjoyed that. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And so tell us, tell us a little bit about, because obviously I mentioned the year 2010. 
I feel like that was kind of the year that everything came together and you Pivotal started. Point. Yeah, that right, that turning yeah. point. So, I mean, what kind of brought you up to that point? And then what was that year for you with kind of yeah. where you were discovering things with patients that you're working with? Well, looking back, it's like even when I had finished my medical studies, um, doing my medical studies, I was interested in uh, something called system theories, mm. which um, basically uh, goes beyond medicine. It has to do with um, like, how do we even, um, I call it perceive reality, you know, because like, if, if we are really honest, we live on constructs, we live on agreements. And that is especially true for Western medicine. Mm -hmm. We live on that agreement in Western medicine that um, there's always just a chemical solution to the you know, bodily problems of our patients. There is not really a uh, taking into consideration the life experience of the patient, emotional involvement, um, you know, like other aspects in life that have an influence on our physical experience, like stress level, inherited stress level, um, generational, intergenerational transmission of trauma, etc. And it all plays a big role in how a person is already born what they are set up to become you know we're not born as um virgin paper so mm -hmm. we come into the world and we already have imbalances we already have burden um we more and more actually have an increased toxic burden and none of that is really as you know respected or looked at in western medicine so yeah. my um first year spent after graduating medical school actually took me into uh, developing a type of body work that I have to admit has partly to do with just a gift that I have to be able to interface with the human body yeah. to sense energies to work with energies but that over time led me to um, to wonder how did my patients get into that state of uh, dis-ease um, that state of depletion to develop these neurodegenerative diseases that I saw mainly around that time in mm -hmm. 2010. Yeah. And uh, I think something unrelated actually to medicine really kind of gave me the aha moment it was my um, boyfriend at the time, he was experimenting with uh, hydrogen fuel cells and he had much success in getting these fuel cells to work which mm -hmm. made me then sit back and go like so that has all to do with proper conductivity or optimized mm -hmm. conductivity and I'm like so what what do you use here like what's the difference between the different tubes of steels that he was using mm -hmm. and he told me you know it's the composition here this one has more molybdenum this one has more of this and then you add potassium chloride to the water to give it a better um, uh, conductivity mm -hmm. and that just hit me I'm like that's the answer it really is about conductivity in yeah. the human body and you know at the same time it wasn't just about the lack of conductivity in people with other people it's the uh, the too much in conductivity like the electromagnetic hypersensitivity for example yeah. Or then even the question that I had always taught myself is like, how am I able to do these things? How can I see energies or feel, mm -hmm. sense, process them? Like what's up with my body compared to, sorry, to someone else's body, you know? Yeah. So that was kind of the opener. And then at the time, um, 2012, I think was another like big aha moment mm -hmm. is I had uh, participated in a seminar in Phoenix that was given by Abbas Kutab, um, basically the teachings of Harry O. Eidenier, uh, yes. balancing blood biochemistry. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were looking at these um, five pages of blood labs, but looked at them from a perspective of mineral and vitamin imbalances. And that just opened doors for me yeah. and, and the frustrations somewhere to say, oh my god you know like you go through years of medical studies and you learn you learn the substrates you learn the uh enzymes you know something about cofactors but you mm -hmm. never make that a important point right or to that degree you know yeah. and then i can say that 
as a next um, like big step up uh, was my meeting with Dr. Rick Malter. Mm, so yes. one of our elders, yeah. venerated elders in the hair mineral analysis community. Uh, but between 2012 and 2015, looking back, was a time with years where I tried to prove my newly found understanding of minerals, mineral changes, mineral imbalances by um, looking for these changes in blood, yeah. in whole blood, in you know red blood cells, mm -hmm. which was already something that helped me understand that my theory was was right but I couldn't get to the same uh like the strength of proof was missing you know it was super interesting because um the minerals I tracked at the time then were like uh manganese copper um zinc yeah, iron yeah. you know and it dawned on me that something was really off with our population because the patients I saw I clearly found that uh I would say two thirds of the patients didn't have manganese levels inside the reference range of manganese, like too low. Yeah. And then the one third that made it inside the reference range, again, two thirds were sitting in Q1, like in the first quartile. Yeah. You know, and um, I think the uh, interesting point here is that the labs get adjusted over time. So, the labs that are mostly run routine labs are constantly updated mm -hmm. and then not tracked in in that change of their reference ranges which is crazy yeah but something like manganese and red blood cell is so exotic that i don't think it's been really looked at and updated or changed right. for a long long time mm -hmm. so like similar to what we have in the hair analysis field where we always talk about the composition of human hair before the year Y2K, um, we have a similar phenomenon in our blood labs, but nobody talks about it right. and nobody has ever tracked it. So mm -hmm. what I found interesting back then was the fact, you know, that some of these minerals are really not as prevalent in our population as they should be. Yeah. Um, I att attributed the lack of manganese back then uh, I think to the influence of possibly glyphosate on the food chain because it's kind of a weak element and it gets easily chelated yeah. by glyphosate. Um, and then, you know, came like the understanding, wow, blood labs are being updated here. I remember 2016, the upper reference range of magnesium was lowered, um, which then made basically lower levels more normal. 2018 the upper reference range for sodium, for potassium, for chloride was lowered. And at the same time, the upper reference range for blood platelets was increased, meaning that translates into a depletion of minerals being adrenal fatigue is now normal mm -hmm. and inflammation now has become normal. And right. none of this is being tracked. Yeah. Yeah. So our surprise you know in the pandemic to see that so many people went downhill fast that mm -hmm. had already pre-existing conditions that were tied in with like increased inflammation um it's been years and years in the making yeah yeah yeah, yeah and i feel like sometimes i mean even when we look at blood labs in general when we're looking at the reference ranges from the lab itself right um looking at functional ranges is different right Right. People, people send blood work and they're like, well, it's all fine. There's nothing, you know, there's only yeah. one thing that's out of range. And we're like, no, actually there's a dozen or yeah. more, right? Yes. Because we're yeah. using different ranges when we're looking at functional ranges yeah. because some of them are so low, right? That bottom end of that range is so low. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's totally off to see a sodium uh, below potassium when it comes to the comparison of the reference ranges. Yeah. So not in absolute numbers, but if your sodium sits in, let's say Q2, like mm -hmm. under the median mm -hmm. and your potassium sits in Q3 or Q4, something's really off because that's an inversion, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. So wow. like that's kind of the time between 2012 to 2015. And then I had this extreme luck to meet Dr. Malter 
like uh, we originally were part of a Facebook group on copper dysregulation that mm -hmm. I exited because um, just didn't make sense. And the only person that really made sense on there was Dr. Malter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I tracked him down and had yeah. to came to the realization that he lives just 20 minutes away from which was amazing when you told Sonata. me that, I was like, that's amazing it was yes. great I picked up the phone and uh, called him and I said um, how about uh, time to meet and that's he was famous. like yes let's meet and so yeah. I look back I think 2015 2016 um, we met almost weekly every Friday afternoon I just closed at three o'clock and then we yeah. had time to dive into minerals so he taught yes. me I think everything he knew yeah. um of and about hair analysis I can the insider stories you know how people came to interpret this or that um, yeah. I taught him whatever I knew mm -hmm. what was interesting was that he um, really often enough had to say you know this is deep biochemistry I am not trained in that it's like I'm trained as a psychologist I know it works yeah but uh, it's going to be up to you to as the mechanism more yeah. and go after the mechanisms of yeah. how this is working and, and I did because some of the things he taught me they just didn't make sense to me like it just did not make sense when looking back at the true function of the organism mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah. and I see that a lot too, like even in our lab evaluations, it's almost like we want things to be a certain way or look a certain way so that we can sit back in our learned understanding and not get questioned right. yeah. <laughs> or challenged, you know, by yeah. the, by the state of nature. Yes. And, yeah. uh, I think it has led me again to, um, basically taking that as a tool and then mm -hmm. reintegrating it with the blood labs. Because something that always bugged me a bit is when the hair community would kind of come together and go like, ah, those, you know, Western MDs, they have no clue and, you know, can't just uh, understand um, the, yeah, the importance of the, you know, minerals and their distribution in the body seen by the hair. Yeah. And, and the common statement you just can't see that in blood and mm -hmm. it irked me so I took all I had learned and had then kind of adjusted in my head and went back to look at the blood labs from that newly found perspective and mm -hmm. lo and behold as you can say you know it's like <laughs> there it was I yeah. could now see in the blood labs and that goes back to being really adamant about the distribution the like the functional reference ranges like yeah. q1 q2 q3 q4 like in what quartile does that element sit mm -hmm. and it totally became clear so i can see many things today in blood labs mm -hmm. that um other people may only be able to see in the hair but then right. i too find confirmation of certain things in the blood labs or um more than confirmation actually the you know, like the, there's one problem that um, we find in the hair is when you are in this loss pattern of potassium, where your yeah. potassium exceeds your sodium. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk about a pseudo inversion in that case, yeah. where the potassium appears high because it's being uh, sent out via urine by the body under chronified stress. Yeah. But the truth is that still in the blood labs, most of the time you find the potassium under the sodium. Exactly. So yeah. in a natural and acceptable position, yeah. but it does happen in certain states, but I'd say maybe 5% of the patients mm -hmm. that it's truthfully an inversion and yeah. in that the sodium in the blood is lower than the potassium, potassium which yeah. is a dangerous situation to be in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've never been able to just step back and say, I don't need those blood labs. I find them absolutely necessary yeah. for the clarification of mm -hmm. patterns confirmation of things going on and uh, just the merging of both is in my opinion what it really takes yeah i couldn't so. agree more and i find myself yeah. saying that more too because you know even when we think about assessing the level of a loss pattern right how big of a loss are we actually looking yes. at? yes the, the only way to correlate that is by running blood labs right absolutely 
And one of the biggest things, and I want to, I want to touch on this just a little bit is, you know, I, I remember there was a practitioner years ago and she, she didn't use HTMA, but she happened to run it. And I think it was a, a different lab. It wasn't Trace Elements. It was another one in Canada. And she made a comment because she did micronutrient testing. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the micronutrient testing basically identified that her client had a zinc deficiency. So mm-hmm. a need for zinc. Okay. And, and of course, not being trained in tissue mineral analysis, mm-hmm. right? She got the test results back for a slow oxidizer and the zinc was elevated. So then she basically set threw it out and said, well, this doesn't make any sense. Well, that's because you didn't assess the loss pattern of zinc. Right. 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 And the fact that there's copper imbalance, right? So, so there's so many intricacies that I feel like get missed when, you know, we're trying to use tests yeah. that we really don't, uh, haven't had the, the opportunity yeah. to study. Right. Interesting that you point out, you know, the micronutrient testing because, um, you know, it's a couple of labs, of course, I just, um, don't, don't trust them in the same way. I trust a hair analysis and the cited blood labs because yeah. they are based uh, for the most part on white blood cells, mm-hmm. which have, you know, their own lifespan, anything from six to 10 weeks or so. Um, they do not reflect tissues. They don't. So I've never really taken to those type of evaluations. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's I not adequate. Yeah. So for, for me, it's been like the really interesting, I think, perspective. I see it like uh, in the old days when we did basic x-rays, you know, not sending people straight to a CT, yeah. <laughs> but you basically have a sagittal and a lateral view on something. So you yeah. have like two uh, planes, you know, yeah. in which to look at a problem, you can create your 3D um image composition of the person in your head yeah and so this is how i look at the blood labs and the hair analysis you know yeah makes total sense yeah like just like if you wanted to look at zinc you know mm-hmm. yeah there's there, well, there are and functional parameters where exactly. you can see in your blood labs to what degree zinc uh, could be missing yeah well and and so i want to kind of dive into because there's a there's a lot of talk today um Mm -hmm. just with regards to to protocols and things like that and when we're talking about zinc a lot of times we're also talking about its its friend and foe copper right Mm -hmm. um and what that does so and and so let's let's tell i mean let's share because a lot of uh obviously viewers and listeners don't understand the relationship of zinc to copper just in general terms and what that represents on on the hair analysis so let's touch on that and then and then talk about kind of some of the things that are going on today with over supplementation of copper without the proper testing in place either, right? People yeah. just supplementing because they're being told that it's necessary for energy production and all these other things. It's it's vast, you know, like so we gotta really kind of like maybe sit back and start where where is the importance of both elements? So where I find zinc very important is in the production of hydrochloric acid because it's essential for carboanhydrase to work. Mm -hmm. So one way to see an impact is by looking at the um, alkaline phosphatase, the ALP or AP enzyme, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that ideally should be around 75. So if it comes in too low, like in the 50s or 60s, I mark that with likely zinc and or manganese deficient because it's both elements that drive that Mm -hmm. um too high alp is a sign of uh gallbladder liver issues uh and maybe increased bone turnover so Mm -hmm. in youngsters you will find it often elevated because they're going through a growth spurt in that case you can't really make something of it right you know but with an adult it's like you know liver gallbladder um or like you you know bone metastases in a cancer case yeah. That is a possibility. Mm-hmm. So and then another aspect that I can verify with the blood labs and coming to zinc is when you would expect that the person um, would have depleted their bicarbonates, their buffer, and it's running high. Yeah. Um, because that is a sign that carboanhydrase is not really able to do its job. And then you look at the chloride level, that's often likely low or has would be low in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, as an expression of the decreased uh, digestive capacity and lack of production of hydrochloric acid. Yeah. And then often you find the sodium low as well. Mm. So low sodium, low chloride, lowered adrenal function, 
lowered digestive capacity, lowered production of hydrochloric acid, and then, you know, looking at the other labs. So it's never like, oh, one thing, most often. It's almost like I, I call it an algorithm, mm -hmm. you know? And that goes back to, it's super important to understand where does the element or the test uh, situate the marker? Mm -hmm. Because nothing needs to be outside of reference range. Yeah, it's just like, oh, this is high, this is low. And so it starts giving you a picture. And that's yeah. super important because one of the biggest challenges today, as you may know, our listeners may know, is uh, insulin, blood sugar dysregulation. Yes. Yeah. Therefore, the run for Ozempic and the Semi increase. Semi or semaglutide, yeah, same thing, yeah. just different the, mechanism of right. delivery. Yeah. Increase of the, like the, the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yeah. as a consequence of the dysregulated blood sugar um, levels. So important because um, the liver undergoes a change in zinc copper metabolism as it uh, becomes more and more pathologic. Mm. Yeah, Zinc becomes ever more depleted and copper mm. actually gets stuck in the tissues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so zinc is super important for blood sugar regulation. It's uh, the element of the pancreas. I always look at it that way. It's like iodine is for thyroid, zinc is for pancreas yeah. and prostate, actually. Mm -hmm. um, intimately involved in you know the blood sugar regulation. So with the um, chronified stresses and the epigenetic you know, passing on of these stressors, we we see these derailed larger mineral patterns yeah and i am not like opposed to copper supplementation where it's needed mm -hmm. but we need to understand that under chronic stress it is rather the zinc that goes out first. yeah first, and gets yeah. lost first yeah. not the copper yeah. yeah um copper uh you know equals like comt um as like a cofactor for an enzyme, it equals um, the superoxide dismutase that is uh, cytosol based, where you have uh, one copper, one zinc element working together. Mm -hmm. um, so copper driving estrogen, you have all these like topics when it comes to copper, yeah. just like you have it with zinc, just like you would have it with manganese, you know? So it's not like any of these elements is bad in itself exactly 100%. they're all needed they're you know? all needed it's just right? a matter of when how and how much how much and the balance <laughs> right exactly and then something that is really overlooked too is how the interplay uh happens with vitamins or the depletion of vitamins under stress how that actually affects then what minerals are doing so for me, one uh, prime example is the ever decreasing levels of B1 under chronic stress and yeah. the descent into lactic acidosis. And with that comes a more infl inflammatory state of the body yeah. and an increase in copper. And so when you find copper elevated in blood labs, you know, it is a late inflammatory, late acute phase element that appears mm -hmm. so first you can see a rise in iron with ferritin levels going up and then you can see a rise in copper okay. with seroloplasmine levels influencing how copper can even be shuffled around how it can yeah. even be put to work and i think there's a lot of misunderstanding in that part of the blood labs and in that part of mineral balancing I agree. And one of the things, and this has been said by, uh, I've heard it a few times, that, that the measure of copper in blood is, is not good, right? There has to be. And so, so you just kind of mentioned that, obviously. Uh, and so just to expand on that a little bit with regards to uh, the I, representation I, of it. Yeah, I, I think what is really important to understand is what are we looking at? So when we look at blood, we see extracellular space. Yeah. When we see, when you look at hair, it's not that we see intracellular space either. We just yeah. see a correlation of minerals. 
for me, it's like the here is a traffic counter that picks up on minerals kind of swimming by just like a reed mm -hmm. standing at the shore of a river, you know, and like at the edge of the river picking up um, whatever swims by. Yeah. yeah. So it's important to understand that because if we see low copper in hair, it doesn't mean necessarily that the person is copper depleted. Exactly. You know, we, yeah. we just we have to say we don't know at this point. Mm -hmm. then you know it's i like to see my parameters in blood and there are moments then i add uh ceruloplasmin i don't know how oh. you pronounce it in english ceruloplasmin yes yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you're close <laughs> ceruloplasmin i would say <laughs> yes ceruloplasmin um and copper in serum and, and zinc and then you yeah. do can do your calculations like yeah. how much copper is bound how much is free um, yeah. how much the percentage and yeah. you know there's like there's a lot of research has been done in the field of Wilson's disease mm -hmm. um, to set some parameters here of what is declared to be healthy and whatnot. Yeah. Um, one thing I think that gets overlooked is that ceruloplasmin is a protein. And exactly. if your liver is not doing well, you have a disruption of protein metabolism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So helping your liver uh, get freed up and get back to work, it will help most of your proteins to be uh, come back to an okay level you know exactly and yeah. the opposite is true as well like this is being used in certain therapies the mm -hmm. suppression of seroplasmin um, to thwart copper and copper effects on the body he employed molybdenum mm -hmm. and came up with a specific uh, molecule it was uh, tetramonium thiomolybdate mm -hmm. to thwart uh, copper and its capacity to drive metastases by driving ah. VEGF, vasoendothelial growth factor, mm -hmm. um, which is tied in in the spreading of cancer and you know formation of metastases. Yeah. So, in my opinion, uh, okay, that was another sort of um, pharmaceutical Western medical attempt to bring in a molecule that just by using molybdenum in itself in increased doses, you can gain this effect without having that chelate into the tetramonium. Yeah. yeah. So just to say that it goes both ways, like we want to bring back action, we want to bring back proteins, we want to increase certain levels of minerals, but then there is a benefit too in being able to thwart the effects of certain minerals. In yeah. Treatment. yeah. Well, and I feel like that's one of the reasons, you know, when we think about looking at hair tissue, right, mm. when we think about looking at minerals from that perspective, even bringing in blood labs, then we're making decisions that are right for the individual, right? Yeah, it drives absolutely. me crazy when you see people put blanket protocols out there and say, everybody needs this. That's yeah. just simply not true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Miracle medium, I can only say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it just it just isn't because we're all different. And even everybody's snips are great. Right? So uh, genetics are different, right? Everybody's genetics are yeah. different. Ev everybody is genetically different. Everybody has different exposures. Everybody walks around in a different phase in their lives, you yeah. know, and, and it's like, oh, can you recommend a multimineral? No, I no. can't. You know, and it's it's just not right. It's like yeah. the number one thing is like if you kind of venture out into unknown territory, you know, do you just run in or do you actually explore, try to read maps, try mm -hmm. to get any information you can before you <laughs> Tipt run tiptoe in? around and see what's going on, right? Yeah. So that you can plan your entry. <laughs> because the, the thing is like you can maybe just you can walk straight into a minefield, you know? Exactly. So not a good thing to do. And yet, you know, we can say that there are basics that mm -hmm. everybody should be aware of. True. And that is something that I uh, don't see yet being taught that way in the hair mineral field. Mm -hmm. And that is what I call the sequential depletion of minerals under chronic stress. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the same for everybody, mm -hmm. same for every human and same for all mammals. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, too, um, there is research being done on the effects of climate change on plants and Ooh, and their change in mineral. Really? So, yeah. That's and 
Ilio Lukadze is the guy who described this, a biomathematician. Yeah. And he talks about the decrease of magnesium and potassium and the increase in carbohydrates in our plants, like planet-wide. Oh gosh. And for me, I saw this article and I'm like, wow, this is diabetes in plants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we see the same in humans. Yeah. We see <clears throat> the decrease in potassium as the first mineral that goes out the window, I call that. Mm-hmm as the um, reflection of increased and chronified stress when your body tries to retain sodium in order to kick out potassium via aldosterone to give you the umph, the energy to keep yeah. going. Yeah. And so that creates the first split where your sodium is um, you know, trying to stay elevated at the expense of potassium. And the more you go into that split, the more you start losing your magnesium. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then as a third element, uh, boron starts being depleted. Mm-hmm. And that's an element that's like hardly ever looked at. You got to order it, order it separately now with TEI. Yeah. Yes. You don't even get it with ARL. Um, yeah. So, and it yeah. is really important to maintain proper trading of calcium across the cell membrane. Mm-hmm. And it is important for um, homocysteine to convert into cystathionine and to be taken down into the um, transulfuration pathway to, in the end, serve as glutathione for detoxification. Yeah. You know, yeah. so some things are, for me, I have to say, basic humbug in, like, laboratory explanations of high homocysteine and what needs to be done about it and um, how high cysteine, homocysteine is caused by the genetic uh Vari- variants, you know, of the MTHFR mm-hmm. snippet. It's like, no, for the most part, homocysteine is piled up because the elements are missing to take it either to become methionine or to become glutathione in the end yeah. by going into the transliteration pathway. So it yeah. goes back to blood labs, you know, homocysteine is one of the markers I look at. If it's high, I know that person is missing P5P activated B6, it's mm-hmm. missing boron. And there's likely a lack of zinc at the same time that prevents it from being taken into methionine yeah. by with you know the presence of enough methyl groups. TMG plus zinc takes homocysteine to methionine. Mm-hmm. You know, so basically another marker that could help in the evaluation of the zinc, the functional zinc status. Yeah. You could say. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and I want to kind of point something out too, just to bring this down into into terms that are digestible as well, because you mentioned MTHFR. And I I think, and I have a number of <laughs> problems with that department. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, people don't realize if they've never done, you know, their genetic testing, they may not even realize that that's something that they suffer from. And think about how many supplements out there that people are looking at, whether mm. it's folic acid, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, cinnacobalamin, right? So when we're talking about methylated, like B vitamins, that they can be methylated, because if you have that, you're going to need that support, but you can't break them down properly, in many cases, depending on right. which ones, right? Mm, yeah. And so when you look at the standard, you know, if somebody's grabbing something off the shelf on a health food store, mm. it, it, you, they're not even going to be absorbing it because their body can't convert it. It doesn't right. have the ability, right? Right. And it kind of backfires, actually. You know right and stealing yeah. energy i feel like you're you're yeah. tra- those people are trying to help themselves but then all they're doing is is they're either do it's doing nothing or it's actually right. making them feel worse right no yeah. it's yeah there's so much to why we should really first test and then yeah. you know pick and choose what we're going to have in the supplementation yeah you know it's like one thing that's uh i know maybe it's a bit jumpy here but b1 <laughs> you mm-hmm. know when b1 is missing uh, and I can only recommend anybody who really wants to dive deeper, get Lonsdale's book, Derek Lonsdale, Chandler Mars's hold book. Hold on, hold on. You have it? <laughs> I, it's right here. It's right here. Yeah. There we go. That's what it I is right the there. Disease. <laughs> you know, yes. Yes. Yeah. Because um, there, there, there may be surprises when you look at blood labs. There may be surprises if you look at like here analysis, cobalt high, yeah. Uh, B12 high without the person even supplementing. What mm-hmm. is it? Well, I mark it as number one, liver dysfunction, and number two, lack of B1 yeah. to um, be needed to actually, you know, be given first 
and then a sequence of other B vitamins and minerals in order to then allow for B12 to start being shuffled around properly and being metabolized appropriately, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. So there's a lot that um, goes into really understanding how your minerals relate to each other. Mm -hmm. What is the natural sequence of how we deplete and how we yeah. need to replete, mm -hmm. you know, and the um, tie in the vitamins have in that yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I remember, cause I bought this book. I think you told me about this back in 2019, yeah. maybe, cause I was reading it when I was in Mexico right before COVID hit. And, and, you know, I suffered for so many years back in like 20, it must've been 2015, 2016, when I had copper issues, my yeah. liver was congested with copper and the, the, and the supplement that I was taking that was recommended had like one milligram of thymine. I'm like, and now I'm like, I always wish I knew then what I know now. <laughs> well, I remember if, if I may kind of lay that open, but uh, when you asked me for help in, you know, the decision making yeah. certain things, because you were like training for your kettlebell. I was, yeah, uh, well, yeah, for, it was in the midst of all this sort of, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And yeah. we kind of stumbled ac uh, across this issue of you taking branch chain amino acids yes that's right right yeah which amino acid are, testing yeah yes which are absolutely dependent on thiamine for breakdown yep. via branch chain said, every, amino right, right all i was doing right. what, what i needed and everything was getting everything was worse because yeah. of this <laughs> well and and, 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 <laughs> and you know this this craziness is like people do workouts which means they drive themselves into lactic acidosis yes. and you know which depletes thiamine and then you take the branch chain amino acids and it's like you need thiamine for that yep. it's um it is yeah, a vicious it's far from optimization yep. it's the opposite you know and and i didn't and it, it wasn't until that time that I realized how important that that single vitamin was, especially yeah. for, just for me and like for me, I mean, again, yeah. testing Everybody. and knowing yeah. what your body needs is the important part. If you yeah. want to feel your best or, or be able to heal from something, obviously you're struggling with. Yeah. But for me, I know that was a huge, uh, a huge thing that, that kind of came out of all of that. Um, yes. I yeah. remember that. <laughs> and, it, and I, that, yeah, it was a long time for me to get, for me to get that back on track. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And so, so I, you know, talking about nutrients, talking about, I, and I feel like too, the unfortunate part of all this is that we have these resources available, right? Mm -hmm. We've had them available. They've been available for longer than I've been alive. Right. And the, the unfortunate part is, is that the people that we end up seeing in many cases, they only find us because they're sick. Right. Right. Like, where's the proactivity? In, yeah. It just in, you know, don't wait till you're sick and you can't, you know, and, you, and now you have all these chronic conditions and things yeah. that then now it's going to take years to work through those. Right. Lisa, like I, I see that it, uh, it totally concerns me. I yeah. try to address that at Western medical conferences, yeah. integrative Western medical conferences, I have to say. Uh, and, and yet I, even in the Western medical field with these colleagues that have a deep desire to be or become integrative medical, I have a hard time getting across how important these minerals are. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it's up to us to propose a topic and I, uh, often, you know, that topic doesn't get picked and I wished we could start there because it's yeah. the underpinning of everything. Mm -hmm. minerals you know? i always always say it's the basement of the house it totally right? is we need to fill the cracks yes. right get yes. the holes filled right yeah because if you don't have a solid foundation yeah. what are you standing on yeah and it's Nothing. like it, it's it's the like underpinning or the like you say foundation of yeah. of anything we want to bring to the table with the patient you know you can't detox if you don't have your nutrient minerals yeah. in order or addressed you know yeah. You can't, like, you need to alkalize the body and your mm -hmm. minerals are what you need for that. Right. You know, it's like a high amount of potassium mm -hmm. will alkalize you, but yeah. you can't, you know, you can't do that without addressing sodium if it's missing or in right. general, yeah. you know? So one of the craziest things I hear 
in the world out there is to tell our patients to reduce salt intake. You know, I, and I agree because it, it, I think it's almost like, you know, back in the eighties when it came out and everybody wanted to lose weight. So it's like, don't eat fat, yeah. fat's bad for us. Yeah. And, oh my gosh. So like everyone went to, so rather than eating butter, natural, a product that's natural. Now we're eating chemicals that are called margarine. Like margarine. Right? Oh God. Yes. <laughs> I'm just like, this doesn't even make sense to me. I don't understand. No. It's kind of the same yeah. premise, right? Because it's just yeah. a misunderstanding. It right. But no it's, it's, but if, if you think about the consequences of, of decreasing your salt intake, you know, it's like your body tries to retain salt at the expense of potassium at all means, mm -hmm. you know? So if you don't um, do your salt intake, you basically mess up all the other minerals. Yeah. So when somebody has elevated blood pressure, what it really takes is potassium because that is not so known, but it's the most anti-hypertensive agent out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. But you yeah. can't patent it. So it's not of interest, right. you know, and there's eternal discussions of what is even the appropriate daily intake of potassium and the latest, we were just talking, the, yeah. about, we were just talking about that. The yeah. latest consensus is 2,900 milligrams for females and 3,400 milligrams for males. However, they arrive even at that, <laughs> you know, and, and in, in our, you know, expertise coming from the hair mineral analysis, we say forever, it's at least 4,700 milligram per day. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it is that, if not more, because yeah. the, the stress load has not eased up on people. It's gotten more and more. You know, exactly. we're exposed to electromagnetic and radio frequency um, mm -hmm. more than we were just 10 years ago. You know, we have a much higher onslaught of chemicals, of, um, you know, mycotoxins in shoddy construction, etc. Yep. Yep. It's like, so the, the need for potassium has actually increased rather than decreased. Yeah. So, and that's, that's, that's getting up to basically about half, right? We're almost half it did yeah. it to some extent, yes. right? Yes. A little and, bit then, and then, you know, it's like, then you see, like, uh, I call it like the pathologic sequencing of medications. Yeah. And that is like, okay, so first the patient as, as we age, you know, we start maybe with having increased blood pressure mm -hmm. or we have, um, you know, intermittent high blood pressure. Yeah. So basically that would require potassium. Mm -hmm. magnesium and your adequate amount of salt yeah. because it's it's a derailment uh, under chronic stress that you are yeah. seeing already you know and it's important too because if your salt is too low your sodium and you give the person um potassium and high dose magnesium you can actually put them into anxiety because yeah. you are uh, hitting the, a body that is depleted of activate of an activating element with calming elements yeah. which is like almost like oh, I'm drowning now, you know? Yes. Yeah. So you got to have your salt in place, but mm -hmm. you definitely have to cite that with adequate amounts of potassium, unless you have a kidney problem. Mm -hmm. That is yes. always important. That's yeah. why you need to check your blood labs. You know, mm -hmm. is, is there anything that indicates that the kidneys aren't functioning properly? Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, then you basically need to, um, have your salt always in place coming in with the with the calming elements and yeah. then you can uh, address like any cardiac issues that way you can uh, blood pressure issues uh, get addressed you can address your swollen ankles in the aging population yes. which is really a sign of potassium depletion and not of too much salt mm -hmm. yeah. because this is the moment the person gets their blood pressure medication they get their um, diuretics Yep. Uh, which will flush out their salt, which will put, which will start a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is kind of the pathologic sequencing of minerals, uh, of, of medications. I'm sorry, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> call that. It's like you start having, you know, the antiarrhythmics, you start having the high, the anti blood pressure medications, then you have your diuretics, you start depleting the minerals, you start mm -hmm. increasing the prevalence of um, arrhythmias likely by doing yeah. that. Yeah. And then you um, have an increased risk of clotting. So then the person gets, you know, put on uh, blood thinners, which affect yes. the liver. And, and then it kind of, from here it's on, it's vicious. sort of downhill. Yeah. And it's chemotherapy. It is chemotherapy, after all. Yeah. It's all chemicals, you know. Yeah. And they're not even understood in their effects on the mineral system. Yeah. 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 
Well, and so. that brings me, so I, I want to mention one more thing and then anyway, because I would like to bring this into the mix and then we'll, so first off, you know, when we're talking about certain things with regards to sodium, potassium levels, things like that, this is only for educational purposes. We're not suggesting that that's any nope. type of dosing you should be taking. You need to do testing if you're interested um, and see what those levels actually are, because every, like we said, there's a need that can be identified, but then there's a level that's going to be for you. Not everybody has the same need for sodium at which level it's at, right? Mm -hmm. So just to kind of throw that out there. But so let's touch a little bit on, because you had mentioned with regards to the medications and the effects on the mineral system, because there's a vitamin that has effects on the mineral system and everybody is taking it, right? And that would be vitamin D. Mm -hmm. right oral d and so and that can have a, a impact on the mineral system and we're talking about potassium so let's share a little bit on that yeah vitamin d3 it's something i don't really often tell people to take yeah and if anything in small doses yeah so where i really use it for sure is when people have too low cholesterol mm -hmm. which actually does occur uh it's something we see quite a bit in our autistic population mm -hmm. more in male in, in male children i don't like can't really explain why that's just like an observation yeah, yeah. um d3 levels depend on the availability of cholesterol of course because it's course. a precursor you know so do your adrenal hormones same yeah. thing you know mm -hmm. um it's important too to understand that cholesterol is a uh, precursor to having proper myelin sheathing. Mm -hmm. So, and ubiquinone formation. Yeah. So, it's an important precursor to all these different molecules and in particular to D3. So, that's when I do work with D3, small mm -hmm. amounts. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, when I see D3 levels low, I understand that the person has been in oxidation for quite some time, yeah. which has used up the D3 as an antioxidant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see it as an expression of deficiency of potassium, magnesium, and boron. Because mm -hmm. these three elements need to be in place to have proper calcium trading. I actually think that the body decreases D3 um, production in order to prevent soft tissue calcification yes by dysregulated calcium yeah. you know and i think there's a lot of harm done by giving high amounts of d3 i've seen it literally like really working itself um out uh, by um, implants that wouldn't take uh, mm. bone healing that wasn't happening yeah. you know because basically that d3 was clamping down on calcium and not allowing for proper mineralization. Yeah. Well, yeah. and to and to put a, a, a little bit of a perspective to that too, you know, we know that about 80% thus far, probably give or take about two or 3% by now, that 80% of the tests that Trace Elements has ever run have been what we call slow oxidizers, which has elevated calcification in the tissues, right? So that's right. a pretty like, big number. I, I think you are basically hinting to the high circulating calcium. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so i'm like uh, I, I don't necessarily use the same terms you know i don't talk about a calcium shell i don't mm. uh, i just mm. talk about high circulating calcium yeah. calcium that's out of um, balance basically yes yeah. yeah yeah so giving uh d3 onto an organism that has the high circulating calcium for me is very questionable yeah because yeah. in my um observation that would lead to soft tissue calcifications like the deposition of calcium places where it shouldn't be exactly and on the other hand when i see that it's like oh we should work with k2 mm -hmm. most of all mina tetranon mk4 mm -hmm. which uh, would take the calcium put it back into the bones we need um, magnesium potassium and the boron in yeah. order to guess re-regulate calcium trading uh, another attempt would to lower calcium would be to work with iodine, which is often deficient in that situation mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Just that with iodine, you start decalcifying the body. So that needs to be understood too. 
yeah. it's not bad it's very helpful at times like mm -hmm. i've seen great success with you know working very specifically with iodine it's a, it's a whole different topic how to do that <laughs> yeah you know? that's a whole different topic yeah. but, but i i agree i've had amazing yeah. results by but implementing to, those practices to yeah. address uh fibromyalgia which yeah. usually comes with a high calcium high circulating calcium pattern yeah 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 wow i mean just so many things about yeah. mineral levels in general i mean oh my gosh we could talk about this for a month <laughs> right? we can because yeah. it because like I said, it is literally the foundation of what you need to stay strong for your, for everything to be working in, in, you know, efficiently and effectively and all, in, in the long run for optimal health. And what we talked about, right. When we were in California, anti-aging, you know, we, we, we don't like that term, but ultimately that's no, what we're doing. Like that's, that's what is the, <laughs> it's just a side effect, you know? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unexpected side effect. Right. Yes. And yeah. you know, I tell people in, and cause they'll, you know, I'll be 50 this year. Right. Mm -hmm. And people will be like, Oh, you know, where do you get your hair done? First yeah. of all, I don't get my hair cut all that often, honestly, but, um, but I, so when I started mineral balancing, I think I was, it was around 42, I think, maybe, maybe 42. Uh -huh. And so I was dying my hair, right? All the way from like, you know, 36 to probably 43. Okay. Uh -huh. And by the time I hit 44, I think it's been that long. I don't dye my hair anymore and I have no gray hair. No. And you know what's That's interesting? Mm -hmm. When I get more stressed, mm -hmm. okay, when I have a stressful period of time, yeah. I'll, I'll get little white hairs. I'm yeah. like, Oh, Oh, okay. Yeah. I need like, to take oh. it. Right. Like, <laughs> mm, that's a light bulb. Let's figure out what's going on here. Cause this yeah, is yeah. not normal. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're all going to get gray hair eventually as we age, but I mean, given, you know, I think there's uh, something to be said for that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I, I could just side with you. Similar things <laughs> like it. I right. never understood how many uh, people and of course women more than men, Yep. dye the hair until I started doing hair analysis. I know. And, and I don't either. Like this is, this <laughs> is original. Right? No, it's exactly. Like here. I know. I know. You know? Yeah. And, and I'm like, Ooh, it's, it's not even about that. It's just like, it's a parameter of um, oxidation and pure oxidation. Yep. Do you have gray hair or not? You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree. Oh. Wow. Well, to be continued, because I think we have, there's just so much more yeah. to, to, there uh, is. to, to, to talk it's about. Like, <laughs> yeah, about our friends, the minerals. Yeah, exactly, guess, exactly. You know, so, I've, I've always looked at minerals like people. They get along with each other. They are like in, you know, yeah, they're exactly. exciting each other. Yeah. They're competitors. Yeah. They're like synergists. Um, it's yeah. like people exactly yep. it's so. true it's like we have our own little society going on yes <laughs> <laughs> oh well and so if you want to get in touch with dr cameron Merva, we will have uh, uh information in the description and uh you can obviously read about her find her we'll share all of where she can be found here and you can obviously always contact our team and uh, and get in touch with her that way too and so thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and share your amazing story and just you know, kind of bringing to light I, and again, bringing back to the surface, something that I'm super passionate about and have been for a very long time, because I think, again, it's, it's really that foundation of health that people need to look at. And if we want to throw a hot topic on there, anti-aging at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you well, so much, Lisa. Thank uh -oh. you everybody for listening in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thanks everybody for tuning in. If you're new to my uh, YouTube channel, make sure you follow, subscribe to my channel, give this episode a like. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast host, make sure you give this episode a like, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to today's show. Head over to lisapatelkila.com to gain access to some amazing free resources that will help you gain energy, erase debilitating symptoms, and be the best version of you. Remember to give this podcast a like and follow me on social media at Lisa Patel Killa. I'm here every two weeks with a brand new episode of the Human Optimization Podcast. Until next time.